Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is America's Commercial Real Estate Show. This segment is brought to you by Barnes Creative Studios. If you'd like a video about your next project, reach out to them at barnescreativestudios.com. Well, today we're talking about industrial real estate insights, and my guest is Ryan Severino. He's senior economist with JLL. He's joined us in Studio One. Ryan, thanks for being with us. Thanks, Michael. Always a pleasure to be in studio. Ryan, you, we know we just heard your friends at uh, Reese uh, talk about the market there. And it seems like there's a lot of things going on with industrial real estate. You know, you've got uh, our new president and everything that he's doing. We kind of have a, a change in economy. You know, what do you see is kind of the, the biggest thing that's really impacting industrial real estate moving forward? You know, I, I, I still think the biggest thing right now is just how important e-commerce has really become to industrial in a way that it's probably been detrimental to retail. I think it's really become the key driver. And I think it's interesting because if you went back a few years ago, I think there was this perception in the industry that e-commerce was going to sort of run its course, that the growth rates were going to have to slow down. I mean, just, you know, the law of, of big numbers, at some point, the growth was going to have to start to moderate. But I think what the industry kind of missed was sort of the rise of mobile commerce, right? I, I think if you go back four, five, six years ago, there was this perception that, that we as a society were not going to be willing to adopt a mobile platform for commerce, at least not to the extent that we were willing to adopt it on sort of a desktop or a laptop platform. But I think if you look at the growth rates where they've come over a relatively short period of time, in nine to 10 years, you've seen uh, the share of mobile commerce relative to total e-commerce go from about 2% to something uh, close to 20%. That's a huge growth spurt in a relatively short period of time. And now, not that people still don't you know, shop on a, on a desktop or a laptop, but the growth driver is really becoming mobile commerce. I think as uh, network speeds get better, as sites become more secure, uh, as the actual browsers and, and the interfaces from most of the, the companies start to become more sophisticated, people generally have become more comfortable with this. And now it's really sort of um, grabbed the baton from sort of the desktop platform and, and is kind of running in the lead with it. And I think that is something that continues to drive uh, demand, both across sort of the bigger boxes that were sort of the original domains of e-commerce to even some of the medium to smaller size boxes that are out there now. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting insight. And, you know, I hadn't thought about that as a benefit to industrial real estate, but obviously uh, those are where the products are coming from and the convenience. Uh, I know I'm shopping more online because it's convenient on my phone. You know, I'm sitting there having a cigar and I think about, well, I'd like to have another cigar. And, <laughs> you know, and if I had to go to a laptop, I wouldn't do it. But if I can just do it with my phone, there I'm ordering. And eventually, you know, Amazon will just yeah. e either have a drone drop it in your lap or beam it to you or whatever the technology Technology of the future yeah. is. But you're right, it, it yeah. really is the convenience sake of it. The idea that you're sitting somewhere, maybe it's home, maybe you're out and about, and you think, oh, I need X, whatever X happens to be. And instead of having to actually go into a store, you know, circa 30 years ago, or wait until you're home in front of a computer, now as soon as the thought crosses your mind, you just turn on your phone or, you know, open your phone and start buying whatever you need, and then it's done. It's it's incredibly, incredibly convenient. Yeah, when you think about it, every consumer almost today is carrying your cash register for your business, right? Pretty much. <laughs> and just think about how you know ubiquitous phones have become. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know what, at what age most parents are willing to turn a phone over to their to their children, but I don't know Pretty anybody young. who doesn't have a smartphone these days. Yeah. Or at least anybody um, above a certain age that doesn't have one. And so yeah. everyone pretty much has e-commerce capability on them almost literally 24 hours a day, which I yeah. think is, again, it's not as if you have to be in front of a computer. Now all of a sudden you are plugged into, you know, our interconnected global economy, you know, 24 hours a day, wherever you happen to be. Yeah. One of the things that we just did, we created a new website and on your phone now you can sign a confidentiality agreement, uh, get access to the, the secure documents that That's we excellent. approve. And then you can make an offer on your phone. Really? <laughs> yeah, you, That's awesome. with DocuSign, so it's legally signed. Uh, and go ahead and make an offer. And so you could be smoking your cigar and, and buy an <laughs> <a> office building. <laughs> that is definitely a 21st century kind of thing to do. So, what else do you think is really impacting? I think a lot of people are concerned, maybe positive, maybe negative, about President Trump, but he seems to do a lot of things that, that might help uh, industry in the U.S. 
You know, I think there are a lot of good things out there, and I and certainly, you know, you could probably make this argument about the overall economy, but clearly, for industrial, I think you know there are ways they can probably improve trade policy, which would be good for industrial, right? There's also the risk they could do things that are maybe a little negative toward that, but mm -hmm. clearly, they can take steps in the right direction to to slowly liberalize trade in ways that are beneficial, right? I think the agreement with China last week, which you know isn't a massive game changer, but I see that as a step in the right direction, right? Let's not be so confrontational about this, right? Trade works the best when it tends to be mutually beneficial. And I think if you, you know, if, if you read through the agreement, which again isn't this sort of broad, uh, you know, overarching uh, trade policy, but mm -hmm. still at the margin, there are a lot of good things in there. And I think if they take a similar strategy with however they approach you know, renegotiating NAFTA and agreements like that. They're talking about, you know, revisiting the, the bilateral South uh, Korean trade agreement. As long as they don't view it purely confrontationally and they really open their minds toward, you know, sort of mutually beneficial liberalization of trade, I think there's a lot of, of potential benefit there, obviously for the industrial sector, which would be hugely beneficial through, uh, you know, liberalization of, of uh, further liberalization of trade. How does Trump's nationalism play into that. I mean, he should uh, buy American, hire American. Should that help industrial real estate? Is it a sector that we should invest in moving forward? You know, if they pull it off the right way, absolutely, right? Because there are ways that we could potentially be doing more in the U.S., right? So if, if we could change the incentives to, and this this is one of my, my, my sort of um, wish list kind of items, but if they could change tax policy so that it was more beneficial to invest in the U.S., there's the potential there for investment dollars to actually start to sprout up a little bit, not just in, you know, sort of amorphous things like research and development, but even potentially sort of property, plant, and equipment and actually start manufacturing a little bit more in the U.S. I certainly think there could be benefits there. They just need to structure it in a way that it actually is a catalyst for investment and isn't just sort of a, you know, big tax giveaway, which, you know, I'm not, I don't say that as sort of a, you know, sort of, raging anti-tax crusader, but there are right ways they can go about this that will actually have knock-on effects for the economy. And there are other ways which, you know, are good for consumers to put money back in their pockets, but might not actually uh, spur that much investment in the economy. What about reduced regulations in industrial real estate? It would seem that that would be a positive for the sector? Absolutely. You know, and, and again, I'm not an anti sort of, um, you know, regulatory uh, uh, hawk or anything like that. But Let's be honest, the pendulum can swing too far when it comes to regulation. And I think regulation, you know, my thought is it needs to be pragmatic and sensible. And I think there are definitely ways they could make it a little more realistic, especially if you start to think about what could potentially happen with driverless automobiles at some point. There's going to be a lot of concern about those. And, and my hope is that um, the regulatory framework doesn't swing too far to, to sort of the restrictive side because I, I think once you start to talk about driverless automobiles, now obviously it, it, it obviously imperils a lot of jobs in the U.S., but if you think about the improvements in productivity and how quickly we'll be able and, and, and more efficiently we'll be able to move goods around, all of that would be hugely beneficial uh, for the industrial sector. So sensible regulation, not too much, not too little, just to feel like sensible regulation tends to be the best for the economy. You don't want it to be the Wild West, but you don't want it to be too restrictive either. Yeah. Well, it'd be interesting, maybe even scary, to look over and see a, a, a big truck and trailer <laughs> going down with not seeing anybody in the cab. Maximum uh, overdrive or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> and you talk about productivity. I mean, nice. Uh, I uh, did took an Uber to the, to the Hawks game uh, recently, and I was able to work for an hour. And I thought, right. well, the, the ride cost me $50, but I actually make more than that an hour, so it, so it made sense. Well, well, stay tuned. I'm going to ask Ryan about some opportunities in the industrial stack sector. Stay with us.